All right, so in my feed was yet another with this, I think, Catherine, Catherine or Kathleen Stewart. I wanted to watch this, kind of do a reaction. As you can see, I did make a comment. I'd like to interview all of you about this topic. I don't know how else to reach out to you, which is true. We'll see what happens. I really want to get them on here like a round table to kind of talk about this topic because it's something that I have dealt with my entire life. Last thing that I'm going to mention has nothing to do with this video. Ever since the last Windows update, the, the sound coming out of this microphone is so loud. I got the gain all the way down. Hopefully it's not blowing out like it was in the last video. See what happens. Anyway, I'm going to start reacting to this video. I really hope that something has changed with that because this is getting out of hand. Still talking <laughs> about it, but I, w I want to bring up something that is like why this is relevant. So I have this weird habit of looking for people's full day of eatings on Instagram and then plugging them into chronometer and just like assessing, right? Like, what are you promoting as what's healthy? I I, I couldn't. I can't even get myself to do it. I can't barely even get myself to eat anything but watermelon. Lately. It's getting really ridiculous. So yesterday I just went on to a few like quote animal based influencers pages, looked at their full days of eatings and one woman was promoting like 1250 calories as like normal two meals. a day. That is insane. That is insane. That was, that's like not even, I think it's like 1900 calories for a toddler back in the, in the forties. Day, 1250 calories total. Mm. And then I found another one and her total calories were 1074. Wow. And so that is not normal. That's not okay. And you, there are going to be health implications of eating that low calorie month after month after month. First, it's. One of the issues, and I know I'm going to have to cut in here a lot. So, you know, if you're if, if that's going to offend you or, or make you mad, then just click off now. But I, I struggle, struggle with this sometimes. Like everybody's like, oh, you eat too much. Like I have told people that I at least interviewed, I will give you my address. You can show up here at any point and see what's actually in my fridge and in my cupboards. Like there's no cheating. I just like. I don't like eating all that much. If I didn't have to eat or sleep, like I wouldn't do either one. But when that, but the, when when I start getting back into eating, I get all this water retention, and, and that's what's going to happen to these people. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So many people. There's two types of people. There's very restrictive people who are able to do that, right? They're able right. to stick to something so restrictive, and then there's another group of people. And you shouldn't feel bad about this. You're going to binge. You're going to restrict, 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 binge. Rest That's what happened with me with keto every single time. I did keto for a long time. Keto carnivore, whatever you want to call it. Every time <laughs> that binge is hard too, especially when I worked at the food distribution company and one of our clients was Cheesecake Factory. And if one of them happened to fall off a pallet, it was a sample. We could eat it. Restrict, restrict, right. restrict, binge. And that's going to lead to fat loss, fat gain, fat loss, fat gain. And in that cycle, progressively lose muscle mass, progressively lose function in the body. So why this is relevant? Because there's so many people promoting a pseudo starvation calorie diet. And that's not OK. It's not OK. So, yeah. And this isn't to only bash on the like animal based people. You see the vegans do this. You see even people yes. in the standard American diet. I'm one of them. And I got a channel about weight loss. It's crazy, right? Like sometimes it's if, if I go long periods without making videos, it's because like I feel like imposter syndrome because I stop eating. It's ridiculous. I mean, not all day. I don't starve myself, but like I'll I'll start going to like the one meal a day or, or something like that, which I I just cannot get enough calories in with that. I don't know how I know a couple of people who don't make channel or don't have channels who do that. And I know a couple of people who do have channels like Peter Rogers MD who do that. And I'm like, how do you get enough in at one time? 
diet that are doing like, yes. if it fits your macros and stuff, do this as well. So I think this is all across the board. And, and, you know, what you were talking about, about the kind of under eat and then binge cycle. So you can see this across a week, but you can also see this across a day where people will under eat all day long. They're like having signs and symptoms of low energy availability, availability all day long. And then at nighttime, they, it's not so much that they overeat, they just like eat all their calories for the day. And so they finally like feel good. They finally have some energy. And then a lot of people are like, why can't I go to sleep? And it's yeah, I mean, it's a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle. It's not. It, there's another thing that goes into it, too. Maybe you're like this. It, once I start something like this video. I want this video to get out today. I probably will not stop until this video is uploaded and then I'll eat. That could be hours. Or if I'm out, I don't feel like bringing stuff in my car. It's, you know, it's, it's stupid, but it's what I go through. It's like, well, you've. And the only reason I'm talking about like what I go through is because I only know me. But I, I think a lot of people go through this, and a lot of people who are overweight are almost ashamed to be seen eating, which is another thing finally have some energy because you just ate and then but you swing back and forth like day to day between this low energy availability state and then like kind of pseudo coming out of it and then going right back into it again so living on cortisol and so this is relevant because i would i would say a lot of people are not underweight right there are a lot of people who do have excess body fat who are overweight but if you're following these like kind of bizarre eating patterns that's going to lead to negative health consequences. And so think of how many people, you know, that say, oh, I haven't eaten all day. Right. Oh my gosh. I would like, there, there are consequences to that. And I'm not saying that the reasons you aren't able to eat during the day aren't justified. Right. But if we have these like restrict binge, restrict binge cycles, like you said, in a 24 hour period or a month to month period, like that is a, and you might actually, like me, get this from your parents. I, my parents do the same damn thing. Like my dad doesn't do it as much as he used to, but he, at the company that, well, I work with him, but the company he was at for 30 years, he was so in demand that he couldn't even take lunch. They would come find him. And he's like, forget it, I won't take lunch. So, you know, stuff like that happens. And then I would see that and I'm like, well, you know, I'll just do the same thing. Form of low energy availability, LEA. Right. Um, so, yeah. And and you're right. It's not just animal based. I just I guess no, no. That we're just targeted on Instagram yeah. like that. It feeds us those things. Yeah. But if you go online and look up like meal plan for women, right. you'll see twelve hundred calorie meal plans. And it's like, look at that. What was her name? Something Emmy. I blocked her out of my life. Something Emmy. Like, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, at first the the diets became like fifteen hundred, and then it was like twelve hundred, and then it was like the five hundred calorie like HCD diet and all of this stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just I, crazy. Oh, mm -hmm. so okay, we're returning back to the Minnesota starvation experiment, which is again a study that would never be able to be replicated today because of how quote immoral it is. They brought the subjects down to a pseudo starvation state, which was somewhere around 1500 to 70, 1700 calories, which is again, something that people are promoting as normal these days. So the subjects ate in a calorie deficit for an extended period of time. And the researchers documented the wide variety of symptoms that happened because uh, the body isn't functioning normally. And then it also served as like a review paper providing like other literature discussing the implications of when people are in a low calorie state, such as in famines or during wartime. And so we've covered a, a, a lot of the book guys, this thing is like thousands of pages. Well, I haven't bought it. I'm not going to sit around and read it, but it is a lot of good info. I did buy this synopsis of it, which was pretty shit book, but, uh, I, I, I can't even recommend. I didn't even, I normally like, maybe I did. Maybe I'm lying, but normally I'll put like in the description section or something like that, a link to go check it out. But I mean, it's not worth it. And so make sure to check out the previous episodes. But in today, we're going to move on to the physiology chapters. And today we're going to focus on like the intro chapter and then the implications on your gut health, your digestive tract and respiration. And then what's left is kind of more circulation cardiovascular response to posture and fainting, uh, renal function, neuromuscular functions, 
sexual function. And then in volume two, there's like psychology, edema, infectious diseases. So there's a lot more, but today we'll get started with the the physiology chapter. So Kathleen, do you want to start us off with chapter 25? Yeah. So I think like right out the gate, they say a great quote and they're like under nutrition quickly results in numerous physiological changes. And these become progressively far reaching as the condition continues. And these functional changes result from structural and metabolic alterations, which in turn must reflect basic biochemical events. But the functional changes are among the first to be discernible, and they tend to dominate the problems of the behavior and the survival of the individual. So I think this quote is amazing, right? Because you see pretty quickly how a low energy availability, pseudo starvation, relative energy deficiency, whatever terms you want to use to define this state. Like in the video that I talked uh, that I talked about the synapses of this book, there was a guy that got caught in the roundabout at a, a department store because he didn't have enough energy. To, and this is uh, 1,540 calories or whatever it was a day. And now people are trying to like live off like 1,200. Like it just doesn't make any sense. It's how quickly it impacts the person. And so, you know, we kind of talk about like, cutting and and being in a quote diet. And this is again, why I'm such a huge proponent of like a get in, get out approach of we're not staying in. I'm here for a a good time, not a long time, right? This like LEA for long periods of time, we should be in maintenance for as much as possible. Um, I I, I love that quote. So do you have anything, any thoughts about that? I had the exact same quote (laughs) written down and then (laughs) immediately, like very soon after the authors literally says low heart rate is a sign of an undernourished person and talk about the amount of people who brag about their low heart rate these days. I got it. When my ex used to lay on my chest, she's like, man, are you even alive? Like it, it, I'm like, um, I think, I think so. It's like, wow. Like I'm able to, my heart rate's so low now. Like I'm, but I mean, athletes do run into this. And when she was doing that, uh, I was lifting. I was pretty athletic at that time. So athletic. Well, it's because they like when you go to the doctor too, if you have a low heart rate, they'll be like, wow, you must be a, you know, a st- athlete, star exactly. athlete. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's in every. Maybe I was fed a lie. Are you, sorry, we're being told this by literally like people that are seen as, you know, authoritative figures. Right. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, you must be a star athlete, but you never run or you never do any type of zone two cardio (laughs) or anything like that. And, but even if you do, like, are you supporting the metabolic demand of those things? And is that the reason why your heart rate is low? And if you were to support the metabolic demand, would you see your heart rate increase? And then, so, you know, doctors will say that about heart rate. They'll also say that about blood pressure, which we see here too, is that everyone's blood pressure decreases. Um, we'll get into the tilt table tests eventually in the, the next episode. Um, but yeah, so yes, bradycardia is a huge issue. Next is a uh, nonspecific bronchitis. How many people do you see that kind of have this like chronic low grade cough or they just feel like there's something in their chest or they like they're they're OK for a couple of weeks and then they get this like kind of chronic low grade cough again and it just keeps coming back. And, you know, people are like, oh, my, my thyroid feels like it's swelling, but it's like, is it really coming more from your chest, you know, from your, your lungs area, um, et cetera. So, yeah. And this, this first chapter is kind of more like an intro into the phys, like physiology problems. But I wrote down this one because I thought that Sarah would be interested. Ooh. I think that um, Sarah has always had like translucent skin. Mm-hmm. So some of her limbs would sometimes look purple. It's not now like Sarah literally. My hands go purple during the winter, during the cold months. I hate the cold months so much. Sorry, I'm watching myself on this screen. I should be looking at the camera. I hate it so much. I, I don't understand why people like cold weather. I, I don't understand it. Maybe it's partly because of that or more, por- partly because cold weather is shit and we shouldn't live in it. Really has skin tone now. Like she tans. She's not. <laughs> but your limbs used to be blue. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, it, it would go from pale to like if I'd get in the shower and I'd be exposed to. I know this is like somewhat of a normal response, but exposed to hot water, it would become like purpley orange that was actually one of the reasons EBLs. i originally go ahead oh, sorry there's just a light be all like blotchy yes blotchy blotchy yeah. purpley and um yeah so it says it's called cyanosis mm-hmm. um so cyanosis is a medical condition characterized by bluish or purplish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes 
It occurs when there is insufficient oxygen in the blood, leading to a lack of oxygenated blood reaching the tissues. So I've, you know, going through our different experiments with diet and eating what we didn't realize at the time it was starvation calories. I definitely would tend towards like this was one of my symptoms would be the discoloration of my skin and cold limbs, cold hands, cold feet. Um, so that's definitely like one of my first signs of being in a caloric deficit or low energy availability. Do you, are you wearing? I, I just like, I never had the purplish skin, but I just remember re- reading through this chapter and I was like, wow, well, Sarah used to. What's so interesting about this is even though we're sisters, we've done almost like every single diet the same, but we start to present the low energy availability. Different. They don't look, their, their facial structure is dead on, but that's where everything s- stops. So, I mean, I wouldn't, I, it's not surprising that they'd have different uh, reactions to things. Differently. So it just goes to show that there's no like exact blueprint of what's going to happen when you go into a starvation diet. Or even if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know if this is what's happening to me. It's not going to be exactly what we're saying in this episode. It could be a collection of different things that we've talked about over the course of like what we've done, like six or seven episodes now. So mine happens to be this cyanosis and lack of circulation, whereas Ashley's is a little bit different. And so how can we expect all bodies to respond the same when we're all given different like stressors and stimuli, right? But it just goes to show like how a low energy availability. I mean, every single thing that they're listing here, I've, I've had or still have. I've actually got so many pictures on this damn thing of purple hands and, and feet. And I used to send them to my doctor um, with no results, of course. The state impacts sy- systemically. Yeah. And I think that's why we are still like you were brought up in the beginning. You're like, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> and it's because there are so many symptoms associated with this. That if you were to just keep listening through all of these episodes, you'd probably be like, oh, yeah, but there's mine. Yeah. But it's because it's because fueling yourself an appropriate amount is the low hanging fruit. It is exactly. the thing. Like if you eat an appropriate amount of calories for yourself at regular intervals throughout the day, and it doesn't have to be every hour, three meals a day, appropriate amount of calories for you like that is a low hanging fruit baseline thing to give your body the fuel it needs rather than looking for all these biohacks, right? Start at square zero, figure out what your maintenance is, figure out what your body needs for total calories without gaining weight. That's a really great starting point. Yeah. 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 And slowly increasing those maintenance calories over time, because a lot of people will say, well, my maintenance is 1200. And it's like, I would argue that's not sufficient. Again, kind of back to that 43 to 48, you know, How was 3540 or 50 or whatever it was in the Minnesota consider maintenance and now somehow 1200 is maintenance and everybody's everybody's lazy nowadays. You got people working two and three jobs just to afford an apartment where there's, you know, crime everywhere. Like, (laughs) I don't think so. Per kilogram uh, body weight or lean body mass, depending upon the person. Um, But yeah, and so a lot of people nowadays um, get diagnosed with levito reticularis. So this is like um, a a lacy, blotchy modeling type skin. So like like babies, for example, you see modeling uh, when a baby is first born because their nervous systems are still um, so underdeveloped that they they express this because they don't do a great job of like responding to temperature changes and um, stress changes and stuff like that. So you see this where you shouldn't see it like you should see that become, um, you know, integrated basically as the nervous systems, the primitive reflexes, all of those things are becoming integrated. But when that doesn't happen or say it does happen and then you enter this low energy availability state and in a way you're kind of almost regressing to be more like a baby like state. We talked about this with like the fat around the torso, et cetera, like around the internal organs. Um, so you see the a lot of these things that you characteristically apply or say, yeah, a baby experiences them, you see them in an adult, um, even things like the primitive reflexes, et cetera. So yeah, you, a lot of people have this kind of like low grade cyanosis, like kind of white blue look to them. Um, or like a kind of, like you said, translucent skin, like you can see, you know, you see this a lot in like the HEDS population, like you see the vasculature 
and you're like, wow, I can like literally just follow your vascular shirt. Like I shouldn't be able to do that. I mean, I I've dealt with this, so I, it's not like, you know, a hit on anyone, but you're like, oh my goodness, yeah. what's going on? You know, I don't have that. You can't even tell that I have veins. So one thing they mentioned, I don't have. Yeah. Uh, do you want to keep covering some of the points in the intro chapter? I yeah. I wrote down some things that I think are just like fascinating because um, I've dealt with some of these things. So starved individuals, they don't necessarily report a lot of thirst, but they drink a lot of water. And Do it all the time. All the time. I mean, I've had days where I drank four gallons. And that could be some sort of like internal mechanism just trying to fill up their stomach due to the low volume of food coming in. And then they also experience like a huge salt hunger mm -hmm. and will consume several times the normal. Never have. I hate salt. I won't even go swimming in the ocean. Normal amount of. I'm, I'm trying not to make this all about me because there's a lot of people going through things. I just try to give examples. Salt. <sighs> and I'm guessing that that's potentially due to like water imbalances, like the edema problem and potentially I mean, salt obviously plays a role in that. And maybe their body is just out of mineral balance due to the low energy availability state. So I have personally dealt with high salt hunger in my past. That's something that I have dealt with. And when I raised my calories sufficiently, that went away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've said this before, or maybe I said it on Tyler's podcast, one of the first signs that I look for when people are entering an LEA is, are you craving more salt? That's a big sign I notice in myself too. Like if I'm starting to crave more salt, I know that I need to start taking steps to address things, whatever kind of has slipped through the cracks because they always do, right? We're human. We have a lot of things going on. Um, but salt is like one of those big first things of, okay, we need to address this. Um, and, yeah. you know, it, it's interesting, too, because they also see increased urine output, especially at nighttime. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that's one of the reasons I can't sleep. I got to piss so much. Oh, it drives me nuts. Like, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I actually I sleep. Right. But at night, the urination is. Hardcore. Almost like a diabetes insipidus. Diabetes. Issue where the, uh, um, they are going to the bathroom frequently at night. And so a lot of people will say, and, and they, they get into like the structure issues more so about the stomach, but like a lot of people will say, oh, that's pelvic floor issues. And yes, it could be pelvic floor issues, but like we're going to talk about with the stomach, they see positional changes of the organs. I think a lot of people have posteriorly t tilted uh, pelvis, you know, pelvises and hips. So, I mean, it could be coming from that. I mean, you see it a lot, especially women trying to push their butt out. Oh. You know, and it might have something to do with that. Happen. And so again, like how much of it is a muscular skeletal pelvic floor issue because of, you know, training, like, like even post pregnancy and stuff like that. And how much of it is more due to the LEA? And I'm not, it, it can definitely be both and it can be both and right. But yeah. until we get this, like, you know, this as the underlying low fruits, like covered, it's kind of hard to then, you know, discuss some of these other things. And are these other things actually at the heart of the problem? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah. So the, uh, voluntary increased fluid intake, increased salt intake, they talk about how, you know, maybe there's an effect on the kidneys, which they're going to discuss more in the renal chapter. So we'll talk about that in the renal chapter, but yeah, for sure. The, um, increased, uh, urine output, especially at nighttime, they talk about gyne uh, gynecomastia. So, got it. When I went on that drive fast, it all went away too. Development of um, basically breast tissue in men, you definitely see that. I, I mean, you see this for sure, like in the aging population too. Uh, so many men get gynecomastia as they get older, and a lot of people say, "Oh, it's because of their hormones, and they're becoming more estrogen-like and stuff like that." And it's like, is it really that? Or is that just a representation of the state that they're in because they're in a lower energy availability state? Because, I mean, a lot of older people, they stop eating as much. They stop sleeping as much. They start to show a lot of these similar signs. So, you know, again, I, I always wonder about that, you know, like, could we help the aging population by making sure they're continuing to eat enough? Um, yeah. And then they, they also see the... Uh, it's amazing. There's so much... Food everywhere. There's so much food waste too. Like I worked in the food distribution. Oh my gosh. That was a struggle to watch how much waste there is, especially the like of raw material, which is, you know, of meat and, and, and all that kind of stuff. 
and then there's so many people who won't eat. It's and then there's other people who, you know, eat so much that, you know, they don't even fit in their doorway anymore. The um, hair, like especially facial hair on women. Um, her, like, that's, this is something that I have dealt with. Um, yeah. her, uh, her, hertuism. Hertuism? Something like that, yeah. What's the right way to say? Is it hertuism or hertuism? I think it's, well, it's, it's spelled like it's spelled hit her. Her suitism, but then again, I say, I say methionine and instead of methionine. <laughs> so, so who knows? We'll just go go off of so whatever. I like another reason why I think that I love these conversations is because like I did this to myself, right? Like I went through so many years of being in a low energy availability state and my health suffered as a consequence. And it like I wish I could go hug, hug my younger self. Like I went, I put, I put myself through so much. And if I would have just ate enough, if I would have just ate enough and not tried to be so thin, I would have avoided a lot of things, but I definitely dealt with hirsutism um, and still have some signs of it today. But they say hirsutism among starving women is very fairly common and it's directly related to their inadequate intake of calories. Right. Like they just say that as a matter of fact, and they see it increase in, in famine areas um, and then decrease when the calories go back up. So I thought that that was an, so, yeah. So back, this relates to that, but I do wonder, so you were talking about the elder population and their, the men developing the, you know, the quote man boobs. Could it also be that they stop eating sufficiently so they're losing muscle mass so their entire like structure is just kind of changing and maybe what was holding up something before is no longer there and related to the facial hair for females there's another thing that happens too but it might be related to all this people start hunching more and when you start hunching more your chest doesn't spread as much as it used to and then there's like skin that starts to kind of come in that used to be spread out. I mean, it really, if you think about our our structure, we're supposed to be like vertical, right? Like a skyscraper. But a lot of us are looking at phones or, you know, and like maybe an older person's case might, might be like reading a book or they can barely see anything anymore. So they're always kind of like this and they're hunched over. You know, that could, it could be causing some of it. Males, I mean, possibly it's like low, low, ener low, low caloric intake and then corresponding hormonal issues yeah yeah so like in the um biochem chapter we definitely see changes to the hormones um and i do agree that i think a lot of it so about like the gynecomastia is structure related but you also do see like localized like breast tissue more develop i i don't know okay. though I, I i don't believe that they develop like breast buds or anything like that because that's done during puberty um i i don't know though i need to look i i haven't actually looked that up um po possibly maybe um, yeah, men can actually lactate like if the woman like in survival days, if the woman died and you're just you're, you're you got to like this baby men can actually fill that role if needed. At least that's what I learned in biology. That's what my biologist told me. Yeah, but but if you were to like <laughs> ultrasound the tissue, it definitely looks more like a like breast tissue. Oh, interesting. Okay. Cause yeah. yeah, cause you start to see sometimes people who are losing muscle mass are sometimes like sagging in places and it's not even fat. It's like right. almost just sagging skin, Structure. like it lost what was underneath. Yes. And so, okay. It's interesting that it's actually different tissue in the breast at that point. So it's not just sagging. Yeah. 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 Okay. You actually see like, um, like, like the, it just looks more like breast tissue. Well, I mean, so that makes sense. Like, all right there's a lot of hate on cortisol, right? Like, oh my gosh, you have to avoid cortisol. Like you can't exercise because cortisol. Um, I think there's a huge problem between Can like- you confirm you were sarcastic there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, very sarcastic. Um, Somebody will take that as a fact. I know. There's like a huge difference between like acute cortisol and then like an over-reliance on the stress hormone cascade, right? And so when you are in a low energy availability state, there's like the definition is there's not enough energy coming in, right? right. And so the stress hormone- glucocorticoid, like all of those, you have to rely on those more in order to generate energy. Like that's just a known thing. And so of course that there's going to be some amount of hormonal issues that pop up due to this. And they document in this initial chapter that there are sexual differences. So like males and females respond differently to these, to this low energy availability state. And they see 
a, decl a higher decline in metabolic rate in women. So the quote was only. As far as the sexual thing goes, it's strange, but I get even hornier when I'm hungry. And I think it's like your body's like, well, we're dying. Uh, let's spread our, our, our seed or our genes. These small losses in body weight suffice to produce large decline in metabolism among these women. Right. And like none of us are saying you shouldn't exercise. You shouldn't be in a calorie deficit for a short period of time. But but doing these, whether that's these really low calorie diets or these not eat all day, binge at night, restrict, restrict, binge. These cycles are going to lead to your body being in a low energy availability state in some amount of time. Right. And that is going to have more impact on women. Right. Yeah. And it's, so again, I think, you know, you said that you wanted to hug your younger self. And I think yeah. in many ways, like we're doing, a lot of people are doing what they think is right because they were told, like they were told from some perceived external, you know, guru or source or whoever that this is what you need to do to get healthy. And so like in many ways, I think we need to like grieve that and move past that and recognize that they were probably just doing what they were told and what they were thought was right. And then, but you need to always take it into context of your N equals one. And like, how are you actually responding to this? Like if you're trying this and you're getting worse, it's probably not for you, you know? And so we, we start these things because of body image, but another great quote that they have. Body image is such a huge thing. And I talked about it in the beginning of this video. People who are overweight, they are almost ashamed to eat because they think they're supposed to starve themselves and overexercise. It's it's a hot mess. Like if you could somehow put yourself on an island, which I kind of like I live, you know, in this I kind of am. Uh, I live in the city, but I have this three bedroom house. It's just me. Um, but if you put yourself in an island. And you had no uh, circumstances outside, no knowledge of anything outside. What would you eat? How much would you eat? And what would you look like? I, I would be interested to find that out. Have is well known hmm. that starved people look much older than their years and that their behavior is generally in conformity with their, their appearance. Ray would talk about this all the time, right? You increase your, your energetic state. Uh, sorry, Dr. P, you increase your energetic state and you become more childlike in many ways, right? Um, you you want to go do when, things. You, when you're not starved. Right, right, exactly, right, okay. yeah. So it says, uh, moreover, the starving man often volunteers the fact that he feels old, but there are no indications that undernutrition actually accelerates the aging process if the latter may be identified with such changes as calcification and sclerosis of the tissues. So I found that interesting. Um, so we feel yeah. old. We look old, we act old, but yet we don't see the same like physiologic changes that we usually identify with the aging process, like calcification, sclerosis, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Can I just relate this back to, Oh yeah. So some people like there's, it's like a kind of a joke sort of not really, but like people are like, yeah, my boyfriend, like I can look at a bag of chips and gain weight and my boyfriend can eat the whole thing and maintain. So like, just it just is fact it's honestly my best friend and i were like that and we're both male right this dude you should like the this dude's diet when we were growing up i'm like how how are how if this guy he barely even had a, a like do cardio and he could go compete in bodybuilding and i'm over here like i could lift the house but like most people, I, I mean, they're like, you're big, but I don't even know if you work out like it's oh, it drove me crazy. It seems like from this paper that that wasn't an example for me. I'm just saying, like, I've heard people say that before, <laughs> but it seems factual from this paper that, you know, women do r respond more severely to caloric deficits. And perhaps it's more of like a protective mechanism because we can bear children and, you know, in a state of famine, that would be not an advantage to be having a child. So maybe we do respond more severely as opposed to men who maybe do have a higher tolerance for the state, maybe for a little bit longer. And that goes back to Kathleen, you were just saying about how some people, you know, 
some people are spreading information about health. Experts are spreading information about health. And that's just because, you know, that's what they've been taught or that's what, what they've done that worked for them. But so many times women are listening to men when maybe that approach for that man is definitely not going to work for you just because you're a different sex at a certain point. Like, uh, I would say this relates back to Ashley and my experience with fast. I mean, McDougal used to say that the, uh, the average hospital, the, uh, uh, custodian probably knew more about diet than the doctors. Fasting. There's, there's so many studies on fasting, but how many of them were done on women too? Not, not very many to my knowledge. Looking for a reason to try the new $5 meal deal at McDonald's? Here's one. Two. And nowadays, even if they are done on women, it's usually the post to the menopausal woman because still researchers will say the woman's cycle pre creates too many confounding variables. That there was a study that was done on females only that McDougal used to quote, and I keep talking about McDougal, but he used to quote this study. I never actually looked into it or how to find it, but... He, he quoted it quite a few times where they took these women and they told them to eat their standard diet. And then they added 1500 calories a day worth of sh just straight sugar, whether it was candy or just sugar to their diet. And after three months, the most anybody gained was a third of a pound. The, that was the highest that anybody got. So that, that kind of goes to show that sugar is not going to make you fat. You know, it's, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but there was a, a there is a couple of female only studies, but not, I don't know about fasting. We, you know, and the study's not long enough and all of that stuff to like kind of wash out that error. And so they, it's usually done on, on older women, which is great, right? Like we need that information a hundred percent. And that's a huge step forward. But we also still need the information on the, the younger population of women, especially leading into that state. And it's just not there. So it, it, it's really, really hard to say. That's why, again, I, I, you know, I think, yes, people rail against anecdote, but like your personal anecdote should matter the most to you, right? Like, because it's you. So, yeah, it should always be under your lens. So, okay. I think a lot of what people do, like you said, is because some sort of external influence told them to do that. But a lot of people do things in, des in a desire to look a certain way. Right. Right. So if someone looks a certain way, they're going to listen to them because they want to look that way, too. Right. Um, something that I wish the Olympics would have done is shown like full days of eating. Here I am talking about full days of eating. But how cool. Yeah. As athletes, man. What would that have be, been to see? Wow. Olympic athletes are doing amazing things, accomplishing incredible feats of athleticism. They're all not in a low energy availability state. It is like the sports nutrition literature is amazing. And it's very well documented that how many calories and carbohydrates these athletes need, right? They have amazing physiques. And I think that if young women and even young men saw how much food and how regularly they ate rather than doing these like random extreme things, it would be a lot easier to see like, oh, to achieve a certain look like you yeah, I mean, some of these people probably just eat McDonald's and KFC and all that kind of stuff. Not that I'm promoting that, but I mean, le legit, probably are. Do have to regularly fuel yourself. Like they're very cognizant of how much food that they're intaking at a regular basis. And so seeing kind of more information about what athletes are doing, I think can be somewhat helpful because it's very well documented that if they want to perform, they've got to fuel themselves. And none of us are Olympic athletes, but I think it's helpful to see that when we are trying to achieve certain tasks in life, that does require regular fuel. Well, I, I wasn't following the Olympics closely, but I did see some people's recaps. How satanic it was. Yeah. So that there were a lot of positives that came. I couldn't even, I couldn't even watch it. I mean, come on, you're going to start off with that shit. No. From this year where a lot of the athletes, they weren't real thin. They're showing normal bodies with muscle mass that aren't you know, yeah. the muscle, the amount of muscle they have might be a little bit of a reach, but they're not unrealistic body compositions. And if you were to go like I clicked a, a few different athletes pages on Instagram and they I don't think there's anybody in the Olympics that's not on PEDs. Okay. We're showing, you know, like some of their food that they're eating because it's interesting for people to see what's offered at the Olympics. Yeah. And it was just notoriously <laughs> always like a ton of rice, a ton of carbohydrate. 
Um, but, but it was also very varied. Like some of the dishes were more plant based. You know, they had their protein, they had their vegetables. But they're so. not fasting. No, sorry, they're definitely not fasting. But I do think that there were a lot of like re- re- um, recap posts on the yeah. Olympics this year, and apparently they did a really good job of showing balanced nutrition, and also realistic body standards, for, okay. especially for females. I really didn't watch that much. I'm not going yeah. to lie. Well, we watched the the gymnasts and they're like so built and stacked, but they're also not like 5% body fat. They were like yeah. a normal healthy percent body fat. So yeah. it was really interesting to see because I, I guess we do hold these people to different standards and say like, oh, look at them, you know, like so ridiculously lean and fit. But I don't know, they're just kind of eating to perform, which doesn't always equate to being ridiculously lean and fit. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say something really fast about how you're talking about the, you know, the, the people that you follow who you're like favorites or you're like hashtag goals or whatever. And, and you think that, okay, if I eat exactly like them, if I train exactly like them, I'm going to look like them. And that, that is fundamentally incorrect. Like, yeah, it's not going to happen. It might happen, but it's not likely. It's not likely at all, especially, I mean, PEDs, you got, I mean, these people are well-funded. You're not most likely it's a completely different animal like it's good to have goals but it needs to reflect some- genetics at that point are going to play a factor you just can't get past that like in my lifting days i mean my starting weight was a lot of people's finishing weight this is what it was someone that is closer to your exact body type um, for example, I, again, I say this all the time. I'm five feet tall. I'm never going to look like someone that's five ten, right? It's just never going to happen. Um, the other thing too, is like based off of your, so, so you have the origin and insertion of the muscle, right? But just, that's a huge, huge factor too. Just because you have the origin and insertion of the muscle doesn't mean that every single muscle fiber is at that origin and insertion you have muscle fibers that are are like all different lengths right and based off of the density of those lengths those specific lengths of muscle fibers and the tensile strength and the fire rate i mean that is such a huge difference and that's that's actually the biggest difference between male and female but it's the biggest difference between somebody who can lift and somebody who can't like my endurance is all right but in weightlifting, like my rep range was like five to eight. I really couldn't go much above that. That's going to give you a very specific look to your muscle. So whether you have a quote unquote long, lean tone muscle or you have like a quote unquote like, um, you know, uh, kind of like balled up muscle where you see that like bicep peak, for example. Yeah. Um, so so I think that's also really important to remember, too, that like just because this person is like they may look like that in spite of their diet and training. Yeah. Not because of their diet and training. And I think that is a big, you know, I have to remind myself that all the time too, you know, because you see people are like, Oh, I want to look like that. And then you're like, Kathleen, that's not possible. (laughs) Well, and your limb length. So like I've got some lanky limbs, right? (laughs) Long arms, long legs. And so that means that literally even, even if the muscles, I have short legs. It's conducive to squatting. My femur is short. I'm a half and half. I'm Irish. Like my legs and my torso are almost the same length. That is like you are a born squatter if you can do that. Now, if you got long ass femurs, you're good at deadlifting, but your squat is not going to be good. We're at the starting bone and ending bone, right? I, my muscles have to traverse a long distance. Whereas if your bones were a little bit shorter, they would poof up a little bit more and show a little bit more. I'm not giving that an excuse. I'm going to build more muscle. Like (laughs) just you guys wait, Um, but your limb lengths impact that too. And one more thing on top of that is just because someone looks a certain way now and follows a certain diet, that doesn't show the 10 years prior of what it took to actually build that physique. And maybe someone built their physique doing something completely different and is now just like maintaining or slowly diminishing it doing a different way. And so, yeah, it's just important to remember these things. There's a, I think, um, 
a lot of people have talked about this, like Alex Leonidas, for example, like they talk about how social media has almost been like a big detriment to people that are wanting to get strong and build muscle because people think that they need to stay small the entire time, like low body fat the entire time versus like allowing themselves to eat in a slight surplus, put on a little bit of body fat, but in order to put on, you know, a fair amount of muscle mass, et cetera. And so it doesn't seem to happen as much with the vegans. Now, I didn't lift in I didn't my heavy lifting days. I wasn't vegan at all. But when I talked and I've interviewed some of the vegan people who bodybuild and stuff like that, they don't really have these cutting phases. I don't I don't know. That might have something to do with the lack of fat that they eat cuz most of them don't eat that much fat at all. So, you know, we're kind of like limiting and meat and fat are kind of like I said in my last video, synergistic. They're usually, I mean, it, it's very hard to find meat, even if it's a lean cut, that doesn't have a fairly large amount of fat in it. Each other's gains because of this. Um, so another, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so to go back to the the chapter, um, another quote that I found great is: "The starving man is weak and cold, both physiologically and subjectively, and his behavior bears this out." On the other hand, his behavior is often misleading. He acts dull and insensitive. He looks and behaves as though he were unaware of or incapable of feeling many of the ordinary stimuli of sound, sight, or touch. They um, experience neuropathy. They experience diminished reactivity to a variety of stimuli or an overreactivity to stimuli, especially depending upon how far into the LEA you are. Um, uh, this is crazy. This is crazy. I mean, I got a lot of that, too. Drugs and hormones. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Drugs and hormones, which ordinarily provoke prompt and striking effects, behave as though their potency was impaired. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> when they gave because my testosterone was low when I was on keto, it was crazy. I didn't have low testosterone beforehand, but after keto, it was like. I, at, at one point, it was like 190 uh, nanograms per deciliter, which is absolutely like, you know, like, I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like a female level. Not really. But and then they gave me uh, all of these kind of testosterone therapies and nothing did anything except for one of them. But that one, I was allergic to the adhesive because they refused to give me the shot because they thought that I was taking steroids and they thought that I was coming in there to get a legal testosterone so they would not give me a shot and the the patch that they gave me i was allergic to and my skin literally was falling off with the patch on it i had i i looked like a leper <laughs> it was ridiculous so the only one that actually worked made me look like a leper and obviously i couldn't use it i will say that again drugs and hormones which ordinarily provoke prompt and striking effects behave as though their potency were impaired this is seen notably with adrenaline, uh, pilocarpine, atropine, and insulin. The vasomotor effects, as well as those on the uh, glucose glycogen system, are greatly delayed and limited in magnitude. These are suggestions also that allergic and anaphylactic phenomena are repressed or they can be over um, experienced. And I'm actually really glad just for myself that I watched this video. I don't really care about anybody else. Not kind of. Yeah, I'm insensitive. In some cases, eczema and asthma become less troublesome or even disappear. So, you know, but that doesn't mean I, that you go ahead. No, I, I had. But so if you got eczema, just starve yourself and it might go away. I had the same part highlighted and I liked the part where they said pharmacology. I'm just kidding. Not a doctor. Don't, you know, I don't want to hear about it. For the undernourished should be quite different from that design for the well-fed man. Yeah. And honestly, Kathleen, you see this so much. Yeah. Uh, Symptom suppression happens hardcore in an LEA state. Right. So you hear people say, oh, doing this diet got rid of my eczema or got rid of this. And like maybe you are removing triggers, but something's happening in an LEA state where you aren't you aren't uh, showing symptoms as much. Right. And I think that that happens in a lot of diet camps. Carnivore. I mean, you see these people. But I feel bad for them, and especially if they go through what I went through. Yeah, it's weird. You like show symptoms in other ways, but then you show less symptoms in this way. I mean, I, that, that's again why it's the LEA state covers so many things, right? Because some of it yeah. is symptom suppression, some of it is symptom, you know, increased symptoms. But the reason why I love this quote is because everyone nowadays is jumping on TRT, thyroid medication, even progesterone, and all this stuff without getting these 
quote unquote fundamentals down first. And a lot of people are having no response to these things. Like they get their testosterone, you know, way into the physiologic, sometimes two times, et cetera, and they get no response to it. Um, yeah. Or, you know, they try thyroid and they either have a really bad response to it or they have no response to it. And we're not talking about just T4, we're talking about T3, NET, like, so, you know, all because Dr. P would talk about that. Um, you know, and, and even like things, you know, so back to like cortisol and like quote unquote Cushing's and like the buffalo hump and all that stuff. Like if you, if you think about it, like we talk about insulin and insulin resistance and over time, how the cells stop like signaling to the insulin, the same thing happens with cortisol and all these other hormones and neurotransmitters too. So like, yeah, sure. You may have quote unquote high cortisol in your blood, but are your cells actually responding to that? Are they actually signaling to that? Damn, this video is good. I haven't watched all of these, this series, but this video, I want to get Georgie Dinkov back on here to talk about this stuff. And so you, well, you may see high cortisol in your blood. That doesn't mean that you're in a high cortisol state, right? Because it comes down to quote unquote receptor density, uh, cell signaling, all of that stuff. It, again, it can't, very much akin to the insulin resistance state that people point to. So, you know, like I think the biggest thing is like we need to be consistent in the way that we're talking about these things because the actions are very much similar. Um, but yeah, yeah I, th I think this is a great, great quote. Well, I think I think I actually I, I probably should be my own study and like make videos about this. Like I see my reflection here. I'm, I'm watching myself instead of the camera and I know I have muscle mass on me. Uh, wouldn't mind uh, unburying it. That part just shows, you know, receptor activity is heavily dependent on the metabolism and energetic state of the individual. And so your like reactivity to a variety of stimuli, whether that's drugs, supplements, uh, things in the air, um, things in food, like that can get really thrown off because it's just not functioning properly. Yeah. Um, they saw things like optic atrophy, um, diarrhea, nonspecific dysentery, colic, flatulence, protruding abdomen are universally recognized symptoms of caloric undernutrition and have been observed whether man's natural food supply has been seriously curtailed wherever, sorry, wherever man's natural food supply has been seriously curtailed. So that, that was the last quote I have for that chapter. Yep. So that was chapter 25, kind of more like an overview of like various physiological problems. And then they dive into of other things. And I'm very excited about chapter 26, which is the gastrointestinal system, because how many people deal with digestive problems these days and the, the changes that they see in the digestive tract in an LEA state, I think understanding those helps you better understand why gut problems are huge right now. It's like the thing, whereas, you know, a, a lot of people say autoimmune conditions stem from the gut. Well, autoimmune has been on like a huge rise. And yes, there's been like changes in the food system. Absolutely. But assuming that you can source the best food that you can, people weren't having problems with oxalates from potatoes. They ate so many potatoes. They I was used to eat up to 18 pounds of potatoes a day. The males, the females, I would think it was like, like I, I read anywhere from nine to 13 pounds, uh, you know, still a lot. They had a lot of dairy. They ate a lot of different variety of vegetables. And they I mean, kids used to have milkshakes for, for breakfast and weren't fat. And those are the people that are still alive. Right? These are the people that are still alive. They're skinny. I mean, they're hunched over and all that shit like I was talking about before. But I don't know. Weren't having these problems in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, when the concept of like dieting and maybe when... They had the finance. And here's the thing. And I know this. I'm only 36 minutes into this and I've been talking for like 20 of it. And here's the thing. People could not afford meat back in the day. There was not a lot of protein back in the day. It was a lot of carbohydrates. And everybody's talking about these oxalates nowadays. It's ridiculous. The only reason ketchup exists is because it has vinegar in it. And vinegar would mask just how rancid the meat was in the cities back in the day. She's talking about 1800s. Look into this. That's Heinz literally com is is really literally exists because of how rancid meat was. And he figured out how to make a sauce. It was kind of like a Chinese sauce at the time. I think it was called ketchup. And he created ketchup. 
And that's why Heinz exists is because of how rancid meat was back in the day. So people were largely eating potatoes and cabbage and stuff like that. Even in like cities like New York, Chicago, I'm here in Cleveland. I mean, you should see some of the old food that these Europeans used to eat. It wasn't a bunch of meat. They couldn't afford it. Finances is available. Um, they were able to consume a lot of food. People ate so much bread, so much bread. There's another bread. Yeah. People used to stand in line every day for bread every day because there was no preservatives in it. So it only lasted the day. Right. And so now we see these huge gastrointestinal system problems. And now that's not to say that glyphosate and GMO and all that kind of stuff haven't absolutely destroyed the wheat. Maybe LEA is playing a role there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And again, we're not saying this is the only thing, but until you've adequately addressed this, and I think the problem is, is that most people believe they've adequately addressed it when they haven't. And that that's like the hard thing to get across. But like, even, you know, what we talked about a, a couple episodes back about the actual organ loss to the intestines, like that alone should tell you that you're going to have some problems with your gastrointestinal system. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so they, they see the, they saw like a, didn't they see like a close to 50% reduction in just mass of yeah. gut tissue? And so how can you expect your gut to function when it shrinks close to half? You can't think about how much surface area that is of absorb absorption surface area that is that you just lost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they say the stomach is often dilated. The stools are watery and contain mucus and undigested pieces of food. Um, all the time I have that. They they swung back and forth between constipation and then diarrhea. So many people have that nowadays, like IBSD and all of that. Don't um, have that. Yep. So the, some feces were frequently bloodied and resembled a, colli a colitis. Um, so this is talking about like uh, the, the literature review. This isn't exactly talking about the actual MSC. This is talking about um, people and other uh, starvation experience, uh, not experiments, other starvation events. Um, uh, so um, another one, so they, they use uh, sulfonamides, which is like was their original kind of antibiotics. They and vitamins were without any effect on the diarrhea. How many people nowadays tell you like, oh, you're having diarrhea, like take an antibiotic and it like clears it up for maybe a little bit, but then it comes back again or it causes way worse issues like yeast issues and all this other stuff too. Um, yeah. The ingestion of large amounts of food intensified the diarrhea, often with fatal results. So this is, again, why, like, you know, I do think if someone is in a really, really bad state, they probably need to be in a hospital, like being actively monitored as they're refeeding, yeah. like 100 percent, you know, from from issues with diarrhea. Like if someone has diarrhea, they need to get on top of that. Right. Because if you're having diarrhea, that means that you're going further and further and further in an LEA because you're not necessarily absorbing your food. You're wasting electrolytes, all of that stuff. And so I, I would just say, like, if you're in this state, please seek help. Like, yeah, you you know, basically, like Dr. Uh, Gadiani spoke, like, you are sick enough. Like, please go get help and make sure that they they don't dismiss you. Make sure that they don't just give you an electrolyte IV and tell you. Man, they are so quick to dismiss people anymore. I, I've got so many stories from this past year, not of myself, but other people that I know. Man, it's it's really getting. Uh, strange. You're good. Like, no, you need to be monitored. You need to be get back to a state where you're not having chronic diarrhea. And then from there, you can slowly build back up again. Um, yeah. But they noted that in all of these different famine states, an increase in diarrhea coincided with the decrease in the food supply. Like they just always saw that trend um, in various times throughout history. And a quote that I wrote down about the diarrhea section was, quote, the diarrhea was the result of atrophy of the digestive glands and a disturbance of water metabolism. Yeah. 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 So many people yeah. nowadays uh, have issues with stomach acid production. They have issues with their um, lower esophageal sphincter, issues with their pyloric sphincter, issues with the ileocelial valve, like all of that stuff. And, you know you see the changes not only with stomach acid production, but you see the changes with the autonomic nervous system and how it's functioning with those sphincters and valves. Um, you, you know, so many people are being diagnosed with things like hiatal hernias and MALs and all of these like more quote unquote structural related things, which we know are directly related to anorexia based off of the eating disorder uh, uh, research. 
and they see that here in the MSC. They they um, keep measurements or tracks. Well, we'll get there. I don't want to jump ahead. But so you see all of these big changes. But I think it's another reason why I like these conversations is like, I know what it feels like to have a diagnosis, right? A doctor tells you a scary word. It's scary. You cry. You get, you are terrified and you don't know, you feel like something's wrong with you, right? And that's what is, I think the best part about these conversations is like, there is a path out. There isn't anything wrong with you. Your body is doing the best that it can given the resources. That's the one thing. That's uh, the guy that helped me lose most of the weight is like, don't be mad at your body. It's doing the best it can. It's keeping you alive. You just haven't been, you know, doing your fair share of everything. Is that it's been given, but now there's all these diagnoses and different like camps of people who have these problems. And if we saw things more in a bioenergetic Gilbert Ling, Dr. Ray Pete lens, where the body is more of like, systemic and you brought up in a previous podcast episode rising tide or what's the right quote the rising tide rising tide rising lifts, all lifts all boats <laughs> and so rather than like feeling like oh i'm doomed for life i've got this right. diagnosis i'm never going to be able to fix this like instead focusing on those foundations and getting out of a low energy availability state like the body is amazing the body can yeah. heal yeah, I think I, I said this like early on to Sarah back when we were talking like over a year ago now about how when I first read Dr. Ling's book In Search of the Physical Basis of Life, that took like the collective weight of the like what I was experiencing, all my diagnoses, everything people, you know, what everyone was telling me I needed to do. It just took it off my shoulders because I was like, OK, I need to get my cellular functioning or cells functioning again. I So I focus on the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. What goes into that? Everything we're talking about, right? Enough food. That's yeah. what goes into that. Um, yeah. so, because it is hard. It's like, oh my goodness, I have like a, like a list of like 20, 15, whatever diagnoses and which one do I have to do first? And like, I, you know, I don't know. And, and so it's, I think this is very like positive and reassuring. And again, this doesn't mean this yeah. is the only thing, but it's like, until you get this, how do you know what else is left? You know? Um, and especially, no, so an, another one. Um, to I'm going to watch a couple more minutes and then I'm going to do a part two of this because I'm only halfway through. Ish. Maybe like half an hour left. I, I don't know. Uh, they recognize that changes in gastric functioning during starvation may render the gastrointestinal tract susceptible to organisms, which under normal conditions would be non pathogenic. So again, H. pylori. SIBO issues with the, you know, in the, the large intestine, um, it's, you know, obviously you see issues with stomach acid production where like maybe the first, um, meal of the day, your stomach is able to produce sufficient stomach acid, but then from there it's the, the refill and the ability to release more again. That's the issue. Um, I, I that's where a lot of heartburn comes from. And, uh, you know, if you got heartburn, you got stomach, your stomach acid isn't, uh, you know, acidic enough. Again, back to you know, the, the sphincter issues and the valve issues and stuff. So, you know, let's like, let's take a step back instead of like pounding the probiotics and the prebiotics and all these other things, like maybe let's address the more fundamental issue of, you know, why is our GI system not working? Because it doesn't have enough energy. Like the, the GI yeah. is, is literally like the skin kind of folded into you, right? Because it's like literally not internal to you. I mean, it's like in your torso, yeah. but it's not internal to you. And so that takes a lot of energy to keep things out and to like maintain its its integrity and job, just like the skin requires a lot of energy too. Um, so, so these things, it's kind of like, of course, it's going to have a problem, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like the All right. I feel like this is a good place to pause it. I will not watch any, I haven't watched any of this other than just watching it now. I will uh, react to the rest of this uh, tomorrow. The video will probably be out tomorrow. I don't know. It'll be out this week. That's it. Uh, comments, questions, if you made it this far, congratulations. I know I've talked a lot through this. It's just, I have a lot to say and I've, a lot of this is just like, wow. Anyways, that is it. Uh, like subscribe. If you think this video will do you any good or somebody any good, share it. 
even if it's just, you know, the original. Anyway, talk to you in the next one. Peace.